Today we're going to be making um, this wonderful cruffin dough. We're going to be making it with a cheesecake filling as well as a, as a salted caramel. I'm cutting corners slightly. I'm going to do half of it in the mixer and then I'm going to do the rest by hand. So at the moment we've got 250 grams of plain flour, 250 grams of strong flour which has got a higher protein and higher gluten level, 11 grams of salt and 6 grams of yeast and 50 grams of um, unsalted butter. So pretty much we're making a, uh, a dough and we're just mixing everything together along with 130 mils of warm water. Depending on the time of the year, your dough will take either a little bit of extra water or less, depending on how much um, moisture there is in the air. So we'll start that on low and we'll start bringing the dough together and see if I need to add a couple of extra tablespoons of water or not. Once the dough comes together, that's when we'll add the butter. Um, but we need to make that dough first prior to making that butter or putting that butter in. So it needs about another tablespoon to two tablespoons of water. I'll increase the speed a little bit. Stop for two seconds. Wipe everything down. We don't want to lose out on any of that yeast that I've put in there. We also put warm water to start activating the yeast um, to kind of bring it to life. Being a live microorganism, we need to uh, give it a bit of food and warmth for it to uh, come alive again. So she needs a touch more water. So now I'm going to mix it on a medium high speed for approximately three to four minutes. That will start bringing the dough together. Then I'll add the butter into small knobs. Um, I'll incorporate it into the dough. Um, and then we'll mix it and knead it for a further 10 minutes, or eight to 10 minutes. Um, and I'll do it, finish it off by hand. So at this point, you can see it's gotten a bit smoother and a bit more elastic. It is a bit tacky and a bit moist, but that's the way we want it. So now we turn it back on, uh, we'll put it onto a really low speed and start incorporating this room temperature butter. So we also call this an enriched dough. It's pretty much what we're making is a, in, in between a croissant and almost like a phyllo or a uh, strudel dough. So it's quite light and flaky and uh, beautiful, delicious hopefully. So once all your butter's incorporated, we'll increase the speed and uh, mix it for, like I said, approximately another eight minutes and then I'll finish it by hand. Now with all the butter incorporated, we increase the speed of kneading and leave her there for the next five-ish to eight minutes, like I said, and then we'll finish it by hand. So as you can see, it is a little bit tacky, the dough. It's meant to be like that, but it's nice and smooth now, which is the consistency that you want. So I'm just gonna finish it by hand. A Little bit of a strong flour onto the bench. Not too much, because you don't want to incorporate extra flour into your dough. So it's a matter of rolling, pulling back, quarter turn. The reason we need doughs is to set the lattice structure within the dough itself, um, which is the gluten strands found in the flour. It's getting a bit too sticky, just add a touch more flour. She's looking really, really good and smooth now. It has to have that consistency, that nice, smooth um, consistency. It means you've kneaded your dough enough. So all we do now is lightly spray a bowl with the oil, place it into a bowl, and just pretty much cover it and let it prove you want it in a in a warm-ish place. Um, it should be around the 38 degrees and optimum anywhere between 28 and um, 32 um, and allow it to grow. It's not going to grow as much 
as some of the other doughs because we've got so much fat in there. Um, but you're going to leave it now for the first proving for about 40 minutes um, and then we'll start moulding it. So we've waited the 40 minutes now and as you can see um, the dough has risen slightly obviously with the, uh, the warm temperature and the yeast coming alive it's created the carbon dioxide and has risen. So now what we have to do we actually have to punch down the dough which means that we have to eradicate or take out all that carbon dioxide that it's created. And then we're gonna start rolling it and I'll show you the next process, which is a little bit more difficult. A little bit of flour again, not too much. As I said before, you don't wanna add or incorporate more flour to your mix. Now, as evenly as possible, you're gonna cut your dough into four. Whilst you're rolling your dough, do make sure you cover it um, to, uh, to prevent it from drying out. So we punch it down, we get rid of all that air. And unfortunately, because this dough it needs to be so, so thin, the only way we can get it that thin is through a pasta machine. So what I'm doing at the moment, I'm gonna set it on the biggest setting and we're gonna do pretty much this, exactly the same process of making a croissant dough, which is the rolling and folding. So dust flour everywhere. Um, because it is a little bit stickier, you're going to have to put extra flour on both your dough and your um, pasta machine to ensure it doesn't stick. So in the center of your dough machine, your pasta maker, you're gonna roll that out. Like so. Again, on the bigger setting. Every time you do it. So now we do a book fold. Fold one over and then lap it over. Quarter turn and through again. We repeat this process six times. And this is what makes all those layers in a croissant dough. So again, fold, turn, flour. Three. So again, so at this point, flour everything again. Now we're gonna incrementally make it thinner and thinner. So you don't actually have to go through each step because it's already, um, we flattened it already. We can jump a couple of steps, go to about the middle, the third or fourth, and then run her through again. Now this gets a bit tricky. You don't want to um, make sure that the dough sticks to each other as it's getting thinner. So lay it on out on your arm and then gently feed her through. As you're doing that, you've got to pull her out on the other side as well, making sure, or trying to make sure it doesn't break. Like so. At this point, again, we need more flour because we're going to get it half the size thinness again. So on the thinner setting, on your pasta maker, and again, feed that through. So as you're feeding it through, move it out to ensure it doesn't stick. Again, you can dust a touch of flour on there to prevent it and triple make sure it doesn't stick together. Have our first pastry dough. As you can see, it's huge and really thin. So at this point, I've got some softened butter, not melted. It's very soft though. This is the messy part. So with with uh, croissant, what we do is actually put a slab of butter, and that rolling process, we kind of um, then fold it with that uh, big piece of butter in the middle. However, with this dough. We get the softened butter and we rub it on top of that dough, like so. Hence why it has to be quite soft, but not melted. So it's best to get your butter out prior to starting any of your dough and it will be nice and soft and ready for you to work with. All right, clean hands. So now it's the rolling process. Starting from this end, we've got to roll it as tight as possible. Like 
like so. Have a beautiful long disc like that. Flour your knife. This will ensure that your dough doesn't stick. Cut it lengthways down the center. And as you can see, I've got this beautiful puff pastry like dough now. Stretch it out just a touch, like so. I've greased some muffin tins. And then pretty much with the cut side facing out, you're making a small knot, like so. And there you have a croffin. So you're pretty much then repeating this process another three times to get through the rest of your dough and you'll have eight croffins. Then we'll do our second proving, which will take approximately two to three hours, depending on the temperature of the environment that you're working in. So after waiting, uh, it's been two hours. I've, this is the second proving or the end of the second proving. As you can see, they've expanded and doubled in size. At this point, I'm going to brush them with an egg wash, um, which is just pain, plainly an egg beaten up. We'll brush that put into a really, really hot oven at 200 degrees. We need that hotter oven for the puff to occur. Um, and then we're gonna bake it for approximately 20, 25 minutes. And they should come out golden brown in color and beautiful and light and fluffy. Egg wash on top, just allows it to go crispy and golden on top as well. As you can see, you can see those beautiful layers, which is obviously uh, the characteristic of a croissant. Um, that's really, really important to get those layers in there. So just quite simply, brush. Don't put too much. You don't want it eggy in flavor as such. You want just that golden brownness that the, um, the eggs will give to your pastry dough. So straight into a preheated oven that is of utmost importance. So 200 degrees, bang in. Um, then we'll wait at about the 15 minute mark. We're gonna rotate both the trays 180 degrees just to ensure that the cooking is even. Unfortunately, every oven works differently and has different hotspots. So to ensure the even cooking, um, we'll rotate that halfway through. And hopefully they come out beautiful and crispy. So 25 minutes later, approximately give or take, you've always got to check it about. I'd say the 20 minute mark is going to be the best. However, when you take them out, they should look something like this. You've got that golden brown color on top and that's also assisted with the egg wash that we've had in there. Um, but best to leave it in the tins for maybe a couple of minutes and then we'll put it straight onto a cooling rack to uh, cool down. We don't want to leave it in the pan to cool down, otherwise it potentially could get a soggy bottom, which means that steam has uh, collected at the bottom and makes the base really really wet which is not what you want so we've left it in the tin for a couple of minutes to cool then we're just pretty much please don't try this at home with your bare hands um, taking it out and you can see they're beautiful and light you can see the layers in there um, crispy and gorgeous that's one tray a couple more in here So we're going to let those cool down completely. We can't put our filling in yet whilst it's hot. Obviously the cheese, the cheesecake filling will just melt and it will be a, a huge mess for you. So we're going to cool those down totally and then we're going to fill them. Okay, so now we're going to make the salted caramel. It's pretty basic. Uh, 60 mils of water, 200 grams of caster sugar. Unfortunately, we do have to use refined sugar for this. Over a medium or high heat. Um, I've also organized, I've got a bowl of water with a brush in it. What will happen when we make sugar syrups is it can crystallize really easily. So to prevent it from crystallizing, we wipe down the edges um, with warm water or just cold water with a brush. And this will ensure that my sugar doesn't crystallize. Um, as soon as one crystal forms, unfortunately, the whole pot will turn. So it's of utmost importance that you do this step. So we want a quite deep amber colored um, caramel. The reason being it will have add that bitterness to the um, the dish, uh, to the cruffin itself, and it won't be overly sweet. So we're gonna take that sugar a little bit further than what probably some people would do normally. 
to get that those bitter tones through that salted caramel. I've also got 125 mils of full cream um, cream, <laughs> thickened cream. I've also got 60 grams of salted butter. Obviously being a salted caramel, we want to add that extra salt. I've also just got some sea salters here as well. I'll add a pinch to taste. Obviously, depending on how salty you want your caramel, depends on how much you'll be adding. So best taste as you go. You can always add more, but you can't take it out. So start with a smaller amount and work your way up. You probably only have to do this two, three times. Because it's such a small amount of caramel, it would actually turn quite quickly. So keep an eye on it. Please don't go and do your washing in between there. So you have to stay in front of the caramel. <laughs> okay, so the most common thing that the, uh, the students do th uh, with this, obviously with the caramel, is either they'll crystallize it and have to start again. Hence why I'm really stressing that you have to use your water and your uh, pastry brush to clean through it. Um, also not reducing it enough, so making it too light, not that amber and golden color. Um, like I said before, what will happen, it becomes too sweet for the palate and doesn't complement your dishes. That bitter, the bitter tones through your dishes actually complement it. All right, as you can see, my caramel is starting to turn. On the outside, you'll start at seeing it color on the outsides first. At this point, you do have to make sure you continuously stir. Now, this is the point where you either burn it or make that beautiful amber caramel. So you do have to take some care doing it. Keep it on that high heat. We'll add the butter first. We'll incorporate the butter. You have to be careful at this point because it will foam up. Um, so with safety, make sure you use a larger pot, not a, a shallower pot. Make sure you also use a heavy based pan. Um, this in, ensures that the conduction of heat is a lot more even. All right, we're almost there. Like I said, I'm gonna take it as far as I possibly can without burning it to add those bitter tones to my dish. Fine line between that burnt and amber. So at this point, you're adding your salted butter. As you can see, it will foam up. I'm gonna mix that through. Then followed by your cream. Mix that through. Please be careful at this point. A long whisk, handled whisk as well, will ensure you don't burn yourself. So as you can see, it comes together looking like an amazing golden salted caramel. However, so a nice pinch of salt to finish her off. Again, you taste her, you might want to add more salt or add less. That's up to the person. Okay, so I'm just about to make the cheesecake filling for our uh, cruffins. It's a pretty easy cheesecake. The only thing I've changed in my recipe, instead of using um, 50 grams of caster sugar, I'm actually using 60 grams of honey. Um, honey is a lot healthier for you. Unfortunately, refined sugar has been um, processed so much that there's nothing, uh, no goodness left in it. So I'm using a a sugar that's a little bit healthier. So I've got um, honey here, I've got some uh, cream cheese, 250 cream cheese and 100 grams of ricotta. 60 grams of, oh, I'm doing one and a half times the recipe, so I've got a little bit of extra honey because the honey is not as sweet as the caster sugar. And I'm just going to zest half a lemon and add that, incorporate that through as well for our cheesecake muffin, um, cheesecake and mix. And then I'll put it straight into a piping bag, put it in the fridge and leave it for when we need to fill our cruffins. So I've brought this to room temperature. Um, I've left it outside for the last probably hour or so. It's just softened up, which means it's gonna incorporate a lot easier. Along with our ricotta, like I said. Honey. I've also, what I did, a little trick if you spray your bowl, when you're using sugars like this, um, whether it's maple syrup or honey, if you spray your bowl lightly with a bit of oil, um, it's much easier, it will come out, and you can see you waste a lot less, which is what you want. And of course, my lemon zest. Best to use a microplane for this. 
you'll find your zest is a lot finer. Um, alternatively, you can just put it onto a grater on a really fine grate. You don't want any of the white underneath. That pith is quite bitter in flavour, so you want to omit that from your recipe. Then, quite simply, turn it on and we mix all our ingredients up. You will need to mix it whilst making it, whilst it is incorporating. You want it nice and smooth and even in consistency. And of course you have to taste it. Fantastic. And the easiest way to fill a piping bag if you haven't got a third hand, just pretty much place it into your uh, a jug, a measuring jug, and then just pour your mix in. Again, using a spatula to get it all out. So from that, push it all down. So we've got it all ready. I won't cut the end off yet. We'll wait until it resets and gets um, firm again um, and ready for the cruffins, the filling of the cruffins. So we've allowed our wonderful cruffin to cool down. So now I'm gonna cut my pastry bag, cut the tip off my pastry bag, push that nozzle through. So open her up as a little bit in the center. You want to fill that center up as much as possible. We're gonna put about a tablespoon of that cheesecake mixture through. I'm gonna put a little bit more of that beautiful cheesecake mix. A few freeze-dried raspberries. Like so. Sprinkle a bit on. And then lucky last, we're just gonna use a little bit of snow sugar to finish her off. And there you have a cheesecake filled cruffin with a salted caramel. Bon appetit!